Well, we all know what comes next. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Enrico Lopez Yanez. I'm the principal pops conductor of your Nashville Symphony, joined today by our music director, Giancarlo Guerrero. Welcome. Hey, Enrico. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. We don't get to do this very often. This is really fun that we're both You know, I mean, together. two conductors, I mean, it, you know, I'm sure there's a joke somewhere in here, you know? That's right. Well, today we're here to talk about an upcoming Pops series concert, which is our Pops Spectacular that's taking place March 3rd to March 6th. Uh, this is something that's really special for me because, you know, for our audience, the Pops audience normally sees me or maybe guest conductors, but they don't always get the opportunity to see our music director on stage and doing such a fun program. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the program and what you're excited about on it and things like that? It's overkill. It's like the greatest hits of classical music, everything that we all know by heart. And uh, for some reason, it always gets relegated to, you know, concerts outdoors or what have you. I mean, here we're going to play it the way that the composers intended. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, honestly, this is the most fun program I'm doing this year just because it's the, the most beautiful, recognizable classical music. The reason why I became a musician is yeah. because I heard these pieces at some point early in my life and they have become a part of who I am. And, and now thank you for the chance of of getting to do them in front of our wonderful Pops audience. And uh, uh, and I know the players themselves are looking forward to it because again, I mean, this is music that we all adore and uh, it's nice to get a chance to play it in a you know, real concert setting. Right, I, I mean, I'm, I can only imagine how difficult it was to choose a program. There are so many pieces out there that are options and then to try and narrow that down to one, you know, Pops spectacular. How did you go about finding what repertoire you wanted on this program? <laughs> Well, I remember you and I having a conversation. We, of course, said, of course, Bolero has to be there. I mean, everybody uh -huh. knows Bolero. And then we said, well, 1812 also has to be there. But it was a tough decision when you think about this. Uh, the other piece that I think was kind of a natural uh, was uh, the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice, just because of the fact that such an entire generation of, of, lo of music lovers uh, fell in love with it because of the movie Fantasia and Mickey Mouse and the whole thing. So all together, I mean, it's just a combination of just great music that, at least in my case, I heard a lot through cartoons or through TV, oh, yeah. even before I knew who the composers were. I mean, it was later on when I became a professional musician. I said, oh, my God, that's Rossini. I, I thought it was Bugs Bunny. But, you know, uh, so as I said, I mean, there's going to be a great uh, connection, I think, to our, our, our childhoods with this music. And uh, trust me, I feel that there's... We have enough for like three other great pop spectaculars just because of the music that we kind of did not have time to add. But uh, there's just so much of it that is part of pop culture. And here, I think we just put what what I think is the most recognizable. And and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun playing it. And the audience is going to love it. That's right. I know I certainly remember Elmer Fudd dressed as a Valkyrie singing, kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit. I thought that was the text. And I found out it was some German opera. But yeah, that's how I knew it. <laughs> Yeah, that was fantastic. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about some of those pieces? I mean, we just heard a clip of the Nashville Symphony playing the 1812 Overture. And that's one of those examples where we all know sort of that last part of the piece, but don't realize actually the Overture is much longer than that little segment that we recognize from TV, from Bonanza and shows like that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of those pieces that we're going to hear more than what we're used to recognizing? Well, the 1812, to me, is one of those pieces that, because it normally gets played, first of all, for July 4th, outdoors, normally no rehearsal, and 99% of the times, at least in Nashville, it gets completely drowned out by a barrage of fireworks. Right. And uh, it really, as you mentioned, is a fantastic overture. It's about 16 minutes long altogether. And Tchaikovsky wrote it to raise money for veterans of uh, Russia, Russian War of 1812. And that's where the whole thing came about. It was intended to be a very serious uh, piece. And by the way, the cannons are actually included by Tchaikovsky. He added 14 cannon shots that were intended to be played by either a bass drum or, or some other, you know, contraption that percussionists have a lot of fun usually coming up with their own ideas. <laughs> nowadays, of course, it has turned into like kind of the national anthem of July 4th. And uh, more than just a 14 cannon shots, we get literally a barrage of, of, of fireworks. But it is an absolute masterpiece when you think of it as an overture. It begins with this beautiful chorale with a small cello and viola setting. And then, you know, it goes through these whole settings of patriotic songs, 
uh, that were all recognizable in Russia. So I feel that this is a piece that deserves to be played the way that Tchaikovsky intended. And I think uh, it may be the first time and maybe in a long time that audiences get to hear this piece indoors. And yes, we will have the cannons indoors or some contraption to Amazing. it, but we're going to play it the way that Tchaikovsky intended because he marked specifically where in the music these cannon shots take place. They're not intended to be random. They're very specific and very dramatic when this happens. Right. You mentioned the idea of, you know, bringing these concert pieces back to the concert hall. A lot of this stuff gets, as you mentioned, relegated to, you know, pops outdoor concerts and things like that. Uh, but another one that really pops into my head is the Blue Danube, which we've seen in movies like when you think of Space Odyssey, you know, and stuff like that. But hearing the full dance suite, it's just amazing. And it is a collection of waltzes, as you know. I mean, Johann Strauss, first of all, Junior was the rock star of his era. I mean, Johann Strauss in, in Vienna and in Europe was the heavy metal rock star. He traveled the world and he wrote, you know, 700 waltzes that were intended to be danced. Of course, Blue Danube has become very famous, as you mentioned, because of its appearance, particularly in the movie, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey. And I'm sure in, a, in more than a few cartoons itself, <laughs> it's such a recognizable melody. But in reality, because this music was intended to be danced, uh, it is actually a collection of waltzes. There's actually six waltzes in the Blue Danube. Of course, we know the opening one, but there are six cons uh, you know, consecutive uh, dances that kind of go through where people just keep twirling and twirling around. And this music was intended to be danced. Uh, Johannes Strauss, Strauss traveled with his own band, and basically they would be put on stage and they would play literally for five, six hours without repeating a tune. And people would just continue dancing as long as I guess there was alcohol involved. People would do it. And uh, this is just intended to be happy party music. And uh, along with the opening melody, which we all know, and we can thank the Vienna Philharmonic for the New Year's concert where they play all of these concerts. They have to do Blue Danube that I think it's uh, uh, it, it's so beautiful that that we recognize these tunes, even if we may not even know who the composers are. Right. Well, speaking of dance, there's one other piece on the program that really stands out to me, which is the Overture to Orpheus in the Underworld, which is another one that is a quite beautiful overture that tells the entire story of the opera over the course of this overture. But then at the very end, there's a very famous dance moment, which is the can-can that we know of. Um, sure. I just have to let you know, Giancarlo, the last pop show we did, the Disco Fever, people that attended there saw me dancing. Is there any chance of you doing the can-can on stage? You know, why not? You know, I'll wear a big skirt and I'll start kicking my legs Amazing. Up. You have to remember that back in the day when this was presented, this operetta, it was kind of scandalous because, I mean, the women were showing their legs, you know, all of them kind of kicking up a storm, uh, you know, and uh, but it is intended as an operetta to be fun. It is intended to be you know, uh, uh, for the audience just to riot. And as you yeah. mentioned, this is one other another one of those pieces that the overture itself is about 10 minutes long. Most people only recognize the ending, the famous can-can. But uh, it, as you said before, there is this whole presentation of all of the themes that are going to come through the operetta of Orpheus in the Underworld, with which we all kind of know the story, you know, behind it. So uh, again, this is one of those pieces also for the orchestra that normally they get to play the ending, and now we're going to get to play uh, the entire piece, including this wonderful little violin cadenza in the middle that is included in the operetta itself. Right. So I have sort of a nerdy conductor question for you. You know, normally on a classical concert, you're we're talking about doing maybe three pieces where you have an overture, a concerto, a symphony. This really is, you know, pops style where you have piece, 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 you know, almost 10 pieces of music. What is the preparation like for you preparing something in this style as opposed to a big, you know, traditional concert? Well, the big question is, how do you rehearse this? Uh, you know, how to make sure you go from piece to piece and give each piece enough time, uh, especially because you have to remember, and, and you will appreciate this as a conductor, all of these pieces, because we know them in some shape or form, either through outdoor concerts or education concerts or some time that we played in the youth orchestra, comes with a lot of baggage. And a lot of that baggage is not good. A lot of it is just bad habits that we've done over many years because we've never had the time to rehearse it. So a big part of the rehearsal process is going to be just kind of like forgetting everything that we know and saying, okay, why don't we approach this as we've, as if, if we've never played it before, which is impossible, by the way. Right. Everything we play comes with a history. And then say, how can we maybe find a way to approach it from the point of view that the composer intended? 
regardless of how he was used later on for a cartoon or for a movie or something else. But the composer, what were they thinking when they wrote this? And let's try to approach it the same way that we do a Beethoven symphony, the way, same way that we do a Stravinsky uh, ballet. And I think from that point of view, there's a chance that these pieces can sound fresh again. So that to me is what, what, what I am looking forward to, the idea of having enough rehearsal time to kind of take these pieces apart. And of course, keep some of the fun stuff that makes these pieces recognizable, but at the same time, bring some of the real geniuses of these composers, because the reason these pieces are so recognizable, first and foremost, is because the composers did an incredible job writing music that is so unforgettable. Whatever that means, I still, to me, it's a mystery why some pieces just stay with us. We, anywhere in the world, people can finish that thought. Right. And why that is, is always, to me, a mystery. And I just give credit to these, these amazing, talented composers that wrote these catchy melodies that even in some cases, 300 years later, we're still humming them along. That's right. Are there any of these, out of curiosity, that haven't come across your plate because of that in quite some time, since they're always kind of done outdoors or things like that? Any of these that you're like, wow, I really haven't gotten to connect All of them. in quite some time? I mean, I can tell you, the last, the only one that I can think, like, recently in the last eight years was Bolero, because I did it in Nashville, uh, okay. which is always the question, how do you conduct Bolero? I mean, once the snare drum comes in, it's out of your hand, right. and then every soloist uh, in the orchestra basically has their big moment under the sky. I do can tell you, and this is a, a conductor uh, nerdy uh, answer, uh, rule number one for Bolero, don't look at the players. Don't freak uh, them out. Just kind of like, you know, you do your thing and I'll, I'll stand up here and look pretty. Uh, yeah. Because Bolero is one of the most difficult virtuosic pieces for every single principal in the orchestra. I can promise you, before every solo, these players, they're, you know, they're thinking about it. I mean, it, it can mess up with your mind. And uh, as I said, once the snare drum comes in with that famous dum ta tum ta ta tum 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 what are you going to do? I mean, there's out of your hands. The players are just listening to the metronome and you're just going along for the ride. Yeah, and I, I think it must be one of the most nerve-wracking pieces for the snare drummer, too, because it's everybody yeah, knows it. No idea, it's, especially it's, because every conductor goes like this. Play it very <laughs> soft. And the poor guy is like, no, I mean, you can play it only as soft as they can. What is amazing is, of course, is, this is this progressive hypnotic crescendo that goes on, you know, famously used in that movie 10. You may be a little too young, but, you know, Bo Derek, anybody who grew up, we were all in love with Bo Derek thanks to Bolero. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I want to thank you for putting together this incredible program. I mean, we, well, thank I, you for, for, for the chance. I mean, we had a great time. And as I said, I feel that we have like four more pop spectacular programs. I mean, there was a lot of music that deserves to be there. And I'm sure we're going to have more chances. To do absolutely. That. We'll have the encore versions in the coming seasons. I think. Of it'll course. Be of course. <laughs> well, that's again, such a pleasure to talk to you, Giancarlo. We are so looking forward to the pop spectacular. Don't miss it. It's March 3rd through 6th with your Nashville Symphony featuring all the greatest hits of classical music. And you can get your tickets at nashvillesymphony.org. Thank you again, Giancarlo, and we will see you all very soon.